Before I start, this is I'm presenting the work of uh, a ton of people. Um, the lion's share of credit goes to Jay and Emre, who are kind of my mentors and um, deserve most of the credit for this work. And then there's a whole team, the whole brain team, the YouTube personalization team. Lots of people are involved in serving these models at scale. Um, so I imagine a lot of you attended the, uh, oh, this is one of my favorite Jeff Dean facts, which is kind of a meme. Um, the 2014 keynote uh, where Jeff kind of laid out his vision for how uh, deep learning would impact recommendation systems with a focus on embeddings. And I was actually in the audience that talk uh, hacking on an early prototype of the system I'm presenting today. So I hope all of you on laptops are training deep networks. Um, and I, I really think that this is kind of uh, the fruit of his vision. Uh, so when I talk about YouTube recommendations, I'm referring to the homepage. Uh, it's a list of videos that we think the user will engage in. It's a very clean problem. Um, but it has a number of challenges. I, I imagine a lot of you are familiar and have used YouTube before. Um, scale, so both training data on disk is enormous, as well as serving latency and QPS. These models are globally distributed. Um, and I'm not allowed to share any numbers, but it's uh, just trust me that it's like super enormous. Uh, we refer to freshness, the idea that uh, there's videos constantly being uploaded. And so there's hours of YouTube video being uploaded every second. And the distribution is very non-stationary. So videos suddenly become viral, and we have to capture that. Um, and with any consumer product, there's a lot of noise. Uh, we rely mainly on implicit feedback signals just due to the volume of the data. You know, there's 10x, 100x more um, implicit feedback signals. Uh, as well as the corpus has uh, kind of not great metadata because it's all user-generated content, and we rely on them to um, sort of structure the, the corpus. So. Uh, Here's like a broad system level overview. So we have the video corpus. We ingest millions of videos. The candidate generation step, um, its job is to winnow down these millions of videos to a set of, uh, say, maybe a few hundred that the user is interested in. We think of this as sort of a course level representation um, whose goal is high recall. So we're trying to create a pool of videos for which uh, five or 10 um, will be really great. And what's input is that is the user history and context. And we follow kind of a typical um, uh, kind of pattern in search where you have a retrieval step and then a ranking step. So ranking, we, we then rank this pool of hundreds of videos. And it's important to note that there's uh, other candidate sources which are input into ranking. So I'm describing today the, the main kind of um, deep learning based candidate generation. But there's lots of other sources that cover the tail, that cover very recently uploaded content. And that's why you wouldn't want to merge these two steps, the candidate generation and ranking, because um, the ranking is kind of ensembling between uh, many sources. So the ranking has additional, additional access to video features and outputs dozens of videos, and that's what actually gets rendered on your phone. And so every time you relo reload the YouTube homepage, you're doing several inference passes through um, several networks. Uh, so talking about candidate generation. So um, I just wanted to briefly talk about, we have this notion of a surrogate problem, so you define um, the, the end goal is like great recommendations that users engage with and that um, they fall in love with your product. But first, you have to define a machine learning problem. And that's um, maybe you want to predict item ratings. And most of your offline metrics already presuppose a surrogate problem that you define. So if you're reducing RMSE on item ratings, then uh, there's no real way to evaluate if that was the right choice. And we haven't come up with a great way other than just live A-B experimentation in the product. Um, and we've also observed that you can overfit the surrogate problem. So you get better and better. You keep reducing your error rate on your surrogate problem offline, but then you push it to live experiment, and um, the results are worse. Right? So that's a terrible situation to be in. Um, so we kind of chose to pose the recommendation problem as extreme multi-class classification. So we're trying to classify the, use, the video the user is going to watch out of a vocabulary of millions of videos. Um, and just to give you kind of um, a, little, uh, a small look into like, how the choice of the surrogate problem is important, uh, it, it, we started out by holding out a random watch from the user's history. So here you see their watch history and their search history in time, and trying to predict that what, what video ID was that random watch. Um, and uh, many classic approaches do something similar to this. Um, but what we found worked much better is uh, to uh, choose a label, cho choose a video to hold out from the user's watch history, and only uses inputs, um, the signals that preceded that label. 
And this, this is important for two reasons. One is which is uh, controlling leakage of future information, which you don't have available at serving time, as well as um, there's a very asymmetric co-watch probability in our corpus. So if you watch video A, you're much more likely to watch video B than the converse. Um, so we found this perform much better. And of course, and the offline metrics, it's impossible to compare. Like um, predicting the future watch is actually a much harder problem because there's no leakage. Um, so this is our, uh, the network structure. I'm gonna walk through it kind of layer by layer and explain uh, what uh, the choices made. Uh, so at the bottom there's uh, embeddings. So these are um, very kind of high cardinality embeddings of, um, here I'm just showing the, the videos the users watch and then uh, search token, to tokenized search history. Um, and this is where all the memory is and all the learnable parameters are mostly. Um, so think like tens of millions of, of parameters. Um, or sorry, nearly a billion parameters. Um, and this is, you can think of this as just like latent factors, um, embeddings, it's all kind of the same. This is more a kind of generalized version. Um, and importantly, these embeddings are learned jointly with backpropagation. So these embeddings are specialized for the particular task, your particular learning task. They're not coming from some other process. Um, and they tend to be high dimensional, so there are hundreds of dimensions. Um, we have the luxury at YouTube of having essentially what feels like infinite data, so we can train very large embeddings. Um, the next step is the combiner. So traditional kind of feed forward networks require a fixed size input. So um, the number of watches you have and the number of search tokens you have can vary dramatically between users. Um, and so we need to somehow summarize those into a fixed size input. Um, in practice, the whether it's averaging or uh, you can do other, you can sum them, you can do a component-wise max. It's not too important. In high enough dimensions, you don't lose much information because everything is kind of spread out in high dimensions. Um, and as you can imagine, this is not the optimal way to represent like a temporal sequence. And I think there's a lot of interesting research maybe around recurrent networks or something like that on how to better represent this. Um, the nice thing about this framework is you can add additional features. So you can add um, embedding of the user's geography. I'll talk more about example age later, but gender, um, you just concatenate all these continuous and, and embedded features. And this gives you nice priors so that um, in a scenario where you don't have any user history, you kind of regress to um, popular content in a region, in a demographic, on a device, time of day, things like that. And then as the user watches, um, it becomes more personalized. Um, and then we add a ReLU stack, um, a, a stack of fully connected rectified linear units. Um, we, we have kind of this tower archi architecture where each layer halves in size. Um, this is where all the flops are. So remember, all the memory is in the embedding, and then all the compute is in um, these fully connected ReLU layers. So that's important when you're uh, designing the network. Um, and you can think at the end, you know, we input everything we know about the user, and then we get a vector at the top. So you can kind of think of this as a user embedding. We don't really explicitly use it, but... And it's all computed on the fly, right? There's no need to cache any of it. Um, uh, then at the top during training, um, we produce a multinomial distribution over the video vocabulary. So this is the likelihood the user will watch this video next um, over millions of classes. We, uh, importantly, you never actually want to compute a full softmax over um, this million vocabulary. So we use this trick from um, especially language modeling, uh, kind of called candidate sampling, it has a few names, but where you uh, choose a, a sample of, say, 5,000 classes, and then the prediction problem is discriminating the true label among those 5,000 classes. Um, and then you can correct for that with importance weighting. We find that this isn't like a huge, um, doesn't have a huge effect as long as you sample enough classes. Um, at serving time, you realize that uh, computing the most likely videos the user is going to watch reduces to kind of a nearest neighbor searching problem. Um, so you, you get the user vector, and then you're trying to find the closest videos um, using the softmax ve vectors. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so there's this cool trick we use. Um, this is feeding the age of the training example during training time. And then at serving time, we set that to zero. So the model thinks it's always uh, serving at the very end of the training window. And we found that this was important for removing bias towards the past, which I contend, mo unless you're very careful, most machine learning um, has a bias towards the historical examples you're training on. Um, you could definitely achieve this with other features, but I think this is like a nice trick. So this plot is showing for a particular video the likelihood over the training window that it will, um, that the user will watch that video. And you see the empirical distribution is there's, um, uh, of course, a spike when the video is uploaded um, and then kind of a, a drop off in popularity. And without the feature, it tends to make the same prediction over the whole training window, but with the feature, it can track that 
the time dependent popularity. Um, and then uh, this is just showing that uh, as you increase the depth of the network um, and you add features, uh, you get better uh, mean average precision. And the, the key insight too is that depth only helps you in proportion to the number of features that you are modeling interactions of. Um, so as we more, add more features, then depth helps us push, um, push the accuracy up. Um, so the ranking model has a very similar structure, um, but has a few important differences. Uh, so features with the same sparse ID spaces share the same embedding. So for example, we have, we're ranking a given um, video impression, and then the user has um, some set of watched video IDs, and those are embedded in the same space, um, as well as the language. And we have this terminology around multivalent and univalent features. So multivalent features are those where the feature has multiple, possibly multiple values in a single training example. So uh, watched video ID is an, ex is an example. And those are average similar in the candidate generation case. Um, uh, we have a lot of continuous features. They're uh, kind of the most important in, in some ways. Um, we normalize them by quantiles. So you imagine if you made a, a CDF of the continuous feature, then you're just taking the y-axis. And this helps spread out the feature so they're equally distributed, which is really important for training these networks. We found they're sensitive to initialization. Um, you can kind of think of the ReLUs as forming kind of splitting hyperplanes. And so having the data spread out really helps, helps the ReLUs find the right splitting hyperplane. Um, and we also add powers of the features for a little bit of expressiveness. It's not strictly necessary. Jury's still out. Um, we had a ReLU stack just like in the candidate generation case. Um, uh, and w you could really put any regression at the top. We have kind of this weighted logistic that, because um, we kind of care about watch time and clicks, but you could have a CTR prediction at the top too. Um, so I think, so we still do a lot of feature engineering, right? The promise of deep learning is that you uh, don't have to engineer any, any more features, but we still spend a lot of effort on that. Um, we have hundreds of features and we're constantly adding new ones. Um, and the challenge is really summarizing this temporal sequence of sparse actions. So we have a time series of watches like searches across different devices, contexts. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting research on how to just feed the raw user information into the network and not have to summarize it by computing histograms of things. Um, so, and the best features we find are often um, uh, kind of doing these crosses between the user and item in the feature extraction step. So this would be, uh, say, the time since the last time you impressed the video, which is important for um, having the, each time you refresh the page, you kind of get different results. It kind of creates this churn in the recommendations. Um, as well as the number of watches you have on the particular channel for the video ranking on the topic. Um, and as in the Canon generation case, increasing width and depth improve this pairwise AUC metric that we use, which is um, how often the clicked impression is ranked above the, um, a random unclicked impression on a given page. Um, and it's important to increase both the width um, and the depth at the same time, because you sort of get these bottlenecks where if the first layer is, is too narrow, then um, um, the depth doesn't help you anymore, because that's kind of the constraining um, part of the network. Um, uh, great, and that concludes my talk. Thanks. <laughs>but you don't have any numbers about how does it compare to the previous system you had, and I don't know if you can release them, but can you say something about how does the deep learning system compare to whatever you had before? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of laborious to create these experiments and prove uh, uh, outside of Google that, that these approaches are superior, but it definitely did outperform um, the previous versions of the system that were kind of matrix factorization-based approaches. So I, I, they had similar approaches, uh, sorry, similar uh, metrics as the shallowest networks um, that we uh, tested in the paper. And, and a very related question. Can you give a sense uh, when you're saying like an increase in uh, mean average precision on say 5%, is that measurable on an A-B test? Because oh, that's what you care about, right? Uh, definitely, yeah. 
definitely you care or definitely it's it, measurable? Definitely there's uh, a, a huge impact in the, well, it depends, yeah, it's, it depends. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. We should talk more. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I imagine that <clears throat> different users have a different need for diversity such as some may watch video for educational purposes, like you watch to see videos on recommendation systems, or you're an actor, you look at plays. Others, maybe you're a rec recruiter or a marketer, you work, but you need a wider range. Others watch it for entertainment, and they maybe don't mind more random switches to other topics. How do you model users need to stay within a narrow topic or to look at random topics? Um. I mean, our attitude is really just uh, whatever's expressed in the data, the model should reflect. And so given enough expressivity, enough features, um, I, it should be able to find whatever behavior exists in the data, I think. Um, we try not to have any kind of like ad hoc prior information built in to the networks. You're considering the uh, video as the video ID as the vocabulary and to get embedding for the videos. I was wondering if you have ever considered using uh, videos image uh, using convolutional network to model video as additional you know, image features to improve your performance. Uh, right, so there's lots of computer vision teams at Google that um, actively work on that. We find that sort of the object recognition um, inside the video or inside the thumbnail is actually not that critical in whether you want to watch the video, that the additional metadata is a lot more important. I think as, um, as computer vision improves, it may be able to actually make recommendations, but so far we found it's not really informative whether there's uh, a dog or a car in the video. Thank you for a great talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I actually find myself um, probably used YouTube three times more than before. <laughs> Thanks for, for the outquick outcome. And, and as a, a user for TensorFlow, I'm really interested in how do you create a surrogate problem, um, especially the metric. Because um, I was just talking to another professor yesterday. You know, the metric that you evaluate in terms of uh, the number of videos people click versus how long people have watched. Uh, probably shows different things about the quality. So the click-through may not reflect actual right. effectiveness of the results. Can you comment some of the choices that you've made in terms of choosing the metric and defining the problem? Uh, yeah, this is constantly a struggle, um, mostly because you're sort of combating abuse at the same time. So if you optimize for CTR, then you get clickbait. And then if you optimize for watch time, you get tremendously long videos. Um, so it's a constant bal balancing act. It's kind of a product decision in a lot of ways that product tells us that we want to um, increase this metric, and then we just go increase it. Um, so it's not really left up to us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I think we have time for one more. Uh, so I have a question here. Um, so you showed uh, that you were doing, still doing feature engineering, which makes sense from the point of view of putting different types of information to network. But you also had some different interaction terms and just raw transformations of those features. Why do you think you need to put those into the network and that it can't learn it for them, from itself by you know, adding different layers? Um, yeah, so uh, you're definitely right. Your intuition is totally right. And in fact, um, we're, we're sort of, uh, it, it's kind of an efficiency of representation, so you can get away with like a narrower uh, first layer if you build in these transformations, um, but they're really not necessary, in my opinion. All right, let's thank the speaker.